Of course! After that conversation's done, what should Harry walk in on? A short time later, I arrived home and I found Meg on the floor, sobbing. How many times does she just throw herself on the floor crying? I mean, is she crying all day long on the floor? So that he's just wandering in and out of doors and just tripping over her body? Like, is that just like where she hangs out on the floor crying? You know what I'm saying? It's like, or does she like wait by the window, see him coming up the walk and throw herself on the floor? How many times could you find somebody in this position? And why is she always on the floor crying? Couldn't you sit in a chair and cry, sit on the bed and cry, sit on the couch and cry? Why are you on the floor? Hey, how are you? Welcome to another episode of I'll Spare You the Details, where we are going through Prince Harry's spare. And in the last episode, he had gotten engaged to Meghan and um they he had gone to therapy in the last uh segment he's are he's starting to have a lot of difficulties with pa he's feeling like the family is um not against megan but he feels like maybe they're not welcoming her the way they could um he and william are really ramping up uh or well according to harry there's a um tons of friction between them and we're going to see that play out a bunch in this section um he makes a ton of claims against william makes claims against kate um he's frustrated with pa um we get, finally get introduced to megan's father lots of stuff about megan's dad being a real nut job being really mentally unstable um constantly painting Megan in this like gorgeous light of the loving doting daughter and the psychotic parent that she has to try to manage from afar so it's so many I mean it's this section is really frustrating I wish you guys could see all the notes that I have in my margins I mean just like so many of the stories are so wild and they're they're wild because it's major accusations zero foundation and I shouldn't be surprised because that has been the tenor of this entire book let me make a claim let me not tell you why let me say this but I'm not going to explain it's like on and on and on and on the entire book is grievances without foundation so I mean nothing new there but we'll walk through it together hand in hand we couldn't do this on our I could not do this on my own I mean, I tell you, I would have put this book down if it, I, I would not have finished this book if it wasn't for this community and all of us enjoying it together. So with that being said, if you are enjoying the videos, please like, comment, subscribe. Um, I love all of your comments. Thank you so much for making this a fun little community where we can all talk together about the book, share information. Um, I think we have a good time. So if you want to be part of this little club we have going on, subscribe. Um, it's, lo it's loads of fun. We have a great time. Okay. Um, oh, uh, before we get started, you know, I always make my little comments about something that was in the comments and one thing really stood out to me on, on, on this last video that I did, um, about concerning the dogs. Okay. So I hadn't, like when I tell you that I have done no research on this subject of this book, I mean it. Because I want to come at this without a whole bunch of preconceived ideas and I haven't listened to any coverage of Spare because I didn't want to regurgitate ideas you guys had already heard and it's hard not to mix in other people's ideas with your opinion if you've just been listening to it a lot. So I, when I tell you that I don't know anything about this couple and particularly nothing about the book, I'm not lying to you. So when he comes to the story about the dogs, I was just reading to you guys the story from the book. I had no idea that she had abandoned one of her dogs. I had no idea that one of the dogs had had casts. The book says that Guy, not the dog that was abandoned, that was Bogart, but Guy had his back legs in casts. But after I got done with the video, and you know I clip up the longer ones, I make the shorter videos in case people just wanna see it like short segments, they don't wanna watch the whole video. I find a picture of Megan and Harry and Guy, the dog, the night of their engagement. So they had taken a little, you know, group selfie and the dog has cast on its front paws. Like, 
on its legs. You can go and you can find the picture or you can go back and find my video. The thumbnail, that's the picture I used. The dog's got cast on its front legs. Now, why, why did they lie about that? Could they not recall that the dog's legs had been cast on the front, not the back? And when I was doing more research about that whole subject, because there had been some comments, there was two comments that I saw where it had been pointed out that or two people commented and said that Harry had hurt the dog. That the story about Guy running away before they she even left Canada and how she'd been at work and she had a babysitter who'd sit with the dogs and the babysitter wasn't watching the dogs and so the, the dog had run away and gotten wounded and then miles away they found Guy and had to get his legs fixed. And there's a couple of people in the comments who said, oh, Harry's the one who hurt the dog. And I could not find, I could not <clears throat> substantiate that claim to, to my liking. I could not find an article or anything that discussed that, um, that I felt was, I guess, reliable enough for me to say that that's like the official, like that he said this, but actually officially, in a fit of rage, he threw the dog out the window, which had been the claim. I don't know about that, but I do find it very suspicious that they can't seem to remember how he broke his legs. One thing I did find, though, was um, a lot of articles about when she was coming to America. She had spoken about her dogs. She said that she left Bogart in the United States, not because he had been tra traumatized by the paparazzi, which was the story that that's the official spare story that the dog's personality had changed that he'd become aggressive to Meg, that he was barking, yapping, carrying on with Meg, that he was lunging at her and that it was an unsafe situation for her. So she gave the dog away to a neighbor. But the official story at the time that she said was Bogart is very old. He wouldn't, he could not withstand a transatlantic plane ride in which he'd have to be in, you know, um, cargo. It's just, he couldn't do it. Um, and like, there was a lot of reasons like, an international uh, move would just be too hard for him. There'd be shots and paperwork. It'd just be too much. So that's why. But I find that just crazy that you would say at one point, an international fight's just too much for him. That makes some sense for a very elderly dog. Okay. But if Megan's dog had been traumatized because of the paparazzi and her whole thing in life is the paparazzi are such hateful beings and they're so wild and they're so crazy and they're so mean that is bonkers to me that she would have not said at the time i can't bring my dog with me because he's not even the same dog because he's been so traumatized those are such different stories and and once she gets to cast herself as a victim so it just feels like for the book they came up with a new reason why she left the dog one that didn't make it seem like she had abandoned the dog, but that the dog had actually turned into something wild and crazy. And wouldn't you know it, it was because of the demon paparazzi. So incongruent, doesn't make any sense. Um, so there's a lot of questions to me about what happened with the dogs. Anyway, we gotta move on. But I just wanted to say, I did see your comments. I do think the dog stories are weird. And I, I can't say that the dog was wounded because it was thrown out of the window by Harry. But I will say that in those same that same article that talked about how Bogart didn't come because he was elderly, they said that the dog didn't get hurt until he was in England and that his legs had been cast, um, you know, shortly after she had moved to England. And so it's like, well, when did it happen? Did he break his legs in, in Canada or did he break his legs in England? It's like, I feel like if I had a dog and his legs got broken, I would remember everything about the scenario. Whatever. Maybe that's just me. Our first story today, we are introduced to Thomas Markle. Remember, that is Megan's father. Now, Harry says that he would have asked Megan's dad's permission to marry her because, of course, traditionally, that's what he would do. He did ask Granny. But he didn't ask Thomas Markle because Thomas Markle is kind of a complicated man. That's not a reason. But apparently he says that it is, he says that Megan is super close to her dad, or she was anyway, like tight. And he says that 
Megan growing up, her parents had been divorced. And so she'd spent the week with her mother and then the weekends with her dad. But then when she got into high school, she moved in with her dad full time. And that's really when they became so close. He says that she, um, even though she had traveled the world, you know, now that she was this world woman of the world, um, that didn't stop her from having an, a, a real close bond with her dad, who she still called daddy, even into her 30s. And he says that, um, she just relied on him and she worried about him. She worried about his health and his habits. She, throughout her entire time on suits, she'd call him every week to consult him about lighting because he had been a lighting director in Hollywood and had won two Emmys. Well, that's good. I'm glad for him. But what in the world was she calling him about the lighting? They have somebody on set for that. Like you would call your dad every week and be like, dad, let's talk about lighting. Well, it doesn't matter what you know, Megan, they didn't hire you about lighting. So what are you talking to dad about that for? Every week you would do this? I don't believe it. Um, but Harry says that in recent years, Thomas Markle had been working regularly and he sort of just disappeared and he'd rented this real small house on the Mexican border and just overall wasn't doing well. Just like everybody else in Megan's inner circle and in her family, Thomas Markle was being hounded by the press and he wasn't handling it very well. Um, he hated be the paps descending on him, taunting him. They were always trying to tempt him. He also seemed very vulnerable to people who pretended to be his friend and they would be kind to him and then try to get information about Megan. And then he was just seemed really gullible. And so he was kind of a liability because he didn't seem to understand that you can't make friends with the paparazzi or the press, that they're gonna tell you one thing and then do another. Harry also wants to let you know and set the record straight that there had been some reports that he was being, that Thomas Markle was being so hounded by the press that he'd had to nail plywood over his windows um, because the press just continued to try to get pictures of him through his windows. And so this was his last resort. But Harry wants to let you know, no, that guy was weird all the time because he had had plywood nailed over his windows even when he was living in Los Angeles. Well before Meg started dating Harry. So, complicated man, really. Just, I'll leave it at that, but the guy's kind of crazy. Um, I think it's real rich, though, that throughout this entire segment, they keep talking about how they would call Thomas and, and Megan would say, don't speak to them, daddy. Ignore them. They'll go away eventually as long as you don't react. And that's what the palace says to do. Yeah, but that's not what you're doing, Meg. You react to everything. You've spent thousands of dollars in litigation, but you want to tell us that you're the voice of reason. Daddy, daddy, listen, daddy, don't, don't talk to them, daddy. Do you just ignore them, daddy? It's like... After pages and pages and pages and pages and pages of this book in which you and Harry are like having conniption fits because of the press, don't try to sell me on the idea that you were the voice of reason, that you were calling up, Daddy, don't listen. Please, Meg, you can't. You can't be both things. You can't be outraged because people are talking about you and also going over to your dad and being like, gotta let it go, Daddy. Whatever. Okay, next section. He says that at this time, right before the wedding, that they had to do this tour, um, an engagement tour. So they had to go through England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. Traveled all over the UK, introducing Meg to the public. Well, that sounds fun. I'd like, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, who wouldn't enjoy that trip? But everything that he says, everything he talks about, it's just, he's just so put upon. Like, oh. and then, we had to go and do the engagement tour and everybody had to have a peace of mind, Meg. It's just, you know, one more thing the palace said we had to do. But it's like, why are you choosing to have a bad attitude about that? That sounds like a lot, like a lot of fun. You know, if you love this woman and you want the country to love her and you feel like she's gotten a bad time of it in the papers, wouldn't you be thrilled at this time that you get to introduce her on your terms and you get to show the whole world about why she's so lovely? He says that crowds went wild for um, 
said that they kept screaming up, Meg, Diana would have loved you. He said he heard that over and over and that it was a total departure from the tone and tenor of the tabloids. And it was also a reminder, he says, that the British press wasn't a reality. Yeah, but that's what we've been saying this whole time. That's why this is so frustrating. Because everything he says about how much the press hated he and Megan, it's like, where did you get that? I, I don't remember, I don't recall that. Um, then he said it was, okay, so now we get into the first of many conversations he's gonna have with William surrounding his wedding. And he says that he was kind of frustrated because it felt like the palace was just dragging their feet on all of the details about the wedding. Like they just wanted to hurry up and get, get married. And the palace was just having it high. They couldn't set on a date. They couldn't set on a venue. They couldn't set on anything. And you know, the frustrating thing was Harry just wanted to get married barefoot in Botswana with Meghan. And, you know, of course they couldn't do that. Of course they had to give their day over to all these, you know, commoners who wanted a little piece of the wedding. So they couldn't do it the way they wanted. But since they were having to do it the way the palace wanted, why was the palace taking forever? He calls up Willie and he's like, you know, I'm thinking maybe we'll get married to Westminster Abbey. What do you think about that? Now I thought, well, you just finished giving us this long spiel about what a disgusting place that was because it's all just full of dead people. Do we not recall at William's wedding how Harry had this long diatribe about what a gross place that was? And now he wants to get married there. But William's like, no, 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 that's no good because we already did it there. So you can't do it there. So then Harry says, well, okay, well, what about St. Paul's? And William said, but that's too grand. That That's on way too grand a scale for you and Megan. Besides, Pond Mummy already did it there. So you, you you don't want that one. Oh, yeah. Right, right. That's a good point. That's a good point. Um, then he suggests that they do it at Tetbury. And he's like, oh, Tetbury? That little chapel near Highgrove? Seriously, Willie? How, how many does that place see? That, that little hole in the wall? And William's like, you're the one that said you want this really tiny, quiet, intimate ceremony. I suggest a tiny, quiet place with which you could have this intimate ceremony and you're offended. And this is when Harry says, you know, their real dream was to just be barefoot in Botswana with maybe a friend uh, officiating. But, you know, they had to share that moment with other people. It wasn't up to them. You know what I have to say to that? Yeah, flipping right. This is, you're gonna try to tell me that Meg didn't want a giant wedding. Oh, is that why she invited all the celebrities and disinvited all her friends? Cause she wanted that real quiet, intimate wedding. Please. And the fact that he would believe it, that he would believe her at this late date of writing this book. Okay, like maybe in the moment when he said, what if we got married in Botswana? Just you and me, just right off in a loop. Wouldn't that be great? And she had been like, oh, that is so romantic, Harry. I love that idea. Okay, if you had believed her in that moment, but for you to, at this late date, be writing in your book that both of you wanted that after you saw the way she acted about the wedding, wanting this huge elaborate thing and inviting all these celebrities she didn't know, you still believe she wanted that small little ceremony? Harry, like you could literally go and tell him, like sell him the moon and he would, and he would buy it from you. I mean, there is nothing that this guy can't be sold on. Okay, so continuing on with how the palace is the worst. They won't settle on a date. Uh, they're dragging their feet. Finally, they agree. Okay, May 2018, there's nothing going on that we have to focus on that month. You can have May. They're going to get married at St. George's Chapel. And they get to have their first public appearance with William and Kate. So this began the whole Fab Four thing. Remember that? And we were all on board. We loved it. We loved William and Kate already. Loved them. And we were more than willing to welcome in Harry and his beautiful young uh, fiance, right? We thought they were amazing. And I remember this. They, four of them came out on stage. They got asked, you know, some fun, easy little questions. It was all for the foundation and it's 10 year existence. The audience is having fun. The atmosphere was super positive. We all recall that. It wasn't that long ago, you guys. It's really shocking to me when I read these dates. I'm like, 2018, that was like so recent. So much has happened since then. Anyway, um, but days later, 
after the whole thing had finished, after the whole thing had aired, controversy. But he does not do a great job explaining to me what the controversy was. And I'm reading this and I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, I kept trying to figure out what it was. He says, days later, controversy. Something about Meg showing support for me too. And Kate not showing support via the outfits or something. I think that was a gist. I mean, the who can say? Certainly not you. I don't know what you're saying. What are you saying there's controversy about Me Too and Kate not showing support? What are they talking about? About via their outfits? Nothing that they said during the, during the interview? Their outfits said this? Kate was pregnant at the time. What about their outfits had anything to do with Me Too? Harry, don't include it if you can't make it make sense to your reader. You know what I always tell my students when they're writing? Don't you dare bring up something and assume that your reader knows what you're talking about. If you cannot explain it in this short little essay that you're writing, you don't include it. Harry, you had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages. You cannot give me a scrap of information. Just drop it there and be like, some about me too, some about their clothes, you know. There was a controversy though. No, I don't know. What are you talking about? Okay, so that wasn't the real thing though. I mean, he goes on to say that he thinks that Kate was on edge the whole time. Um, because right now, she because she was entering into a new phase in which she was going to be compared to Megan all the time. And the thing is, according to Harry, like, who could stand up to the scrutiny of being compared to Megan? That beautiful face. Of all the people on the globe, Catherine has zero to worry about when it comes to comparison with another woman. I mean, every woman on earth, can you imagine being compared to Catherine? If anybody had anything to feel squirrely about in this scenario, it was Megan. I would loathe to have to sit on stage with Catherine because, not because Catherine's not a lovely person, because she is a lovely person. And how could you ever stand up? Her manners are impeccable. Her clothing is impeccable. She always has the right thing to say. She always has a genuine smile. I mean, she has it down to a science how to be a royal. And can you imagine entering into that and being the American and being, you know, un, un, unschooled and untrained and exactly what this looked like. Now, I'm not saying that nobody helped Megan figure out how to act as a royal. I don't believe that for a, for a second that no one helped her. But what I am saying is just because royalty isn't in our culture, you don't always know some things. All I'm trying to say here is Catherine would not have been the one concerned about a comparison. Um, okay, now we come to this story, and I'm, I'm sure you guys have heard it. Um, he says that there was a, an awkward moment backstage. Apparently, Meg asked to borrow Kate's lip gloss. Harry says that's an American thing. I assure you it is not. But anyway, Meg asked to borrow Kate's lip gloss because Meg forgot hers, and she was worried that she would need some, and she turned to Kate for help. At an event like this, I, I, I think there would be somebody there who could help you with your makeup. Um, and you wouldn't need to go digging around in the bag of this girl that you don't really know that well. Um, Kate was taken aback and she went into her handbag and she reluctantly pulled out a small tube. Meg squeezed some onto her finger and applied it to her lips. Kate grimaced. Some clash of styles, maybe? Something we should have been able to laugh about soon after, but... It left a little mark. And then the press said something was up and tried to turn it into something bigger. Okay, first of all, the press would never have known about this little backstage skirmish. Have you not just told it? Okay, but let me just say how I feel about this. I know that some girls, you know, they're fine. Like, let's use each other's makeup and stuff. But it could have just been that I grew up with a mother who had uh, gone to cosmetology school and did hair and makeup and so she had told me my whole life don't borrow other people's makeup it's not it's not a clean habit you know it's like you don't want to be you don't like don't borrow people's mascara don't bother people's lips lip gloss don't borrow don't borrow brushes it's it's not clean like even if it's your own stuff you've got to wash your brushes you got to keep your stuff neat tidy clean you know would you use somebody's toothbrush you know what i'm saying like it's on your mouth don't you don't need to be borrowing people's lip gloss so I read this story and I'm totally team Kate on this I I don't know you can't borrow my lip gloss I'm sorry 
you can have this too, but I don't want it back. You know, that's how I would feel. And I'm, I'm not a germaphobe or anything like that. But when it comes to makeup, you don't share it. No, I mean, I, I know that there's like a lot of girls, they don't care about it. They're, you know, they're in the bathroom. They're like, oh girl, I need this. Oh, can I borrow that? That's fine. If that's how you want to be, I don't care. I'm just saying that I totally get why Kate was like, I would prefer you not to borrow my lip gloss. But, you know, I don't, if that's not a cult, it's, it's not a class of cultures. It's just some people are okay sharing makeup. Some people would rather not. I don't share makeup. And I, I it's not weird at all to me that Kate was uncomfortable in that scenario if indeed she was okay that's the other thing we don't we'll never know if it was if this is a true story or not but like would you want would you want Megan's lips all over your stuff I I wouldn't I'm not gonna go real real far into that but who knows where that mouth has been that's all I'm saying um okay so now we come to the part where Granny um, formally approves of the, the marriage. She got, gives a royal decree, as she would. Um, he says that at this time, they brought home a little sibling for Guy. He says that poor little Guy, poor the beat-up beagle guy, had been needing a new friend. Yeah, because they abandoned his other one. And he said he had a friend in Norfolk who gave him a little black Labrador, um, and they named the little creature Pula which is Setswan and for rain, and that means good fortune. He says that work challenges aside, he had, he just couldn't believe his good fortune. I mean, he woke up in the bed with dogs and a woman, and, you know, he'd never been so lucky. Those aren't the same. Dogs, and then also Megan. Um, and he says that, you know, Meg was finally done with suits. He appreciated that they had, in the show, Meg was getting married and so that was like the pretense for why she was, you know, why that character wouldn't be seen anymore. And he appreciated the fact that they had, you know, shoved her down a lift shaft or something like that because, you know, they'd been decent about how they'd let her go. Some people get shoved down elevator shafts on soaps, but he wanted to make a big distinction about the fact that she's not on a soap. But then he says something to this degree, whatever. Um... Again, he's got some more of this real negative Debbie Downer tenor where he's saying that the press was a lot quieter about them, but it's only because they were such such scoundrels waiting for every little bit of news that they could get about the wedding. So they they forgot that they hated Megan. They forgot that, you know, she was black and so they didn't like her because of that. And then they got kind of distracted on wedding stuff. Wasn't that they weren't just vicious racists anymore. It's just that they were real into what kind of flowers Harry and Meghan were choosing for the wedding. But, you know, don't, don't get fooled, okay? Don't get fooled. They're still psychotic white supremacists, but the wedding was taking precedence at the moment. Why would you choose to say it that way? Why? Um, he says, oh, 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 okay. This section right here, I was just like, Truly, truly a child has written this book. Can you imagine the little um, pieces of paper scrawled with pencil and crayon markings that have been handed to the ghost writer? Because listen to this, what Harry, Harry writes here. No detail too small, not even a portaloos were left out. It was reported that we'd be providing the poshest portaloos on earth, porcelain basins and gold-plated seats after being inspired by the ones at Pippa Middleton's wedding. Well, in reality, we didn't notice anything different about how or where people went pee or poo at Pippa's wedding, and we had nothing to do with choosing the pool to lose at ours, but we sincerely hoped that everyone would be able to do their thing and comfort him in peace. Above all, we hoped the royal correspondents would continue to write about poo instead of trying to stir it up. That's a legitimate portion of his book. This is part of his memoir. He just talked to us about pee and poo and the port at his wedding. We didn't get any details about why he was forced into therapy. What outrageous bout of wrath and indignation he exposed to his would-be wife that 
you know, forced him into extended therapy. No details about that. But he wants you to know there is places for people to go pee and poo at his wedding. Okay. Um, he wants to let you know that he won another battle um, in the preparations for the wedding. And it was against the Royal Rota. He says he had always hated the Royal Rota. And that it was just full of individuals and it was a system created um, to discourage fair competition and, and engendered cronyism and it encouraged a small mob of hacks to feel entitled that they always had the first story about the royals. He did not want any of that part of the press corps involved in his wedding. And he'd been told he could not keep them out of the building when he got married, but he would to war over it and he got them out of the out of the room and they weren't going to be allowed to come in. They could have to stand outside, hang around outside like a bunch of losers, but they weren't coming into the wedding. So he says it was a small victory, but he celebrated it hugely. Then he goes on to this, tells us about how they needed to decide what kind of wedding music they wanted. Now, both Megan and Harry were anti-organ. They wanted an orchestra and I second that decision. Well done. But they needed to decide what they wanted. He says that Pa had them over for dinner and let's listen to lots of music and figure out what you guys are gonna play. It's a lovely little portion of the book. He says that they listened to a lot of classical music. Meg said that she really liked Chopin and that um, that she had a deep feeling for it. She loved Chopin, but she said in Canada, she, she'd actually grown dependent on him because Chopin was the only thing that would soothe Guy and Bogart during the siege of the house. Remember the siege by the paparazzi. And she plays Chopin for them day and night. I mean, that is just so much drivel. So much. It almost feels like maybe that was the only classical musician that she'd ever heard of. So she like made a story of it. Anyway, Paul likes Beethoven. But he smiles sympathetically about her need uh, for Chopin. And he's having a great time. He's airy and he's witty and he's charming. And uh, Harry just can't believe his dad's such an awesome person. I mean, this is a side to him he'd never seen. He says that a, a Meg evokes so much in him. Qualities I've rarely seen. In her presence, Paul became boyish. I saw it. I saw the bond between them growing stronger. And I, I felt strengthened in my own bond with him. So many people were treating her shabbily. It filled my heart to see my father treating her like the princess she was about to, maybe born to be. Maybe born to be, aren't you marrying her? Is that still not, what are you talking about? Anyway. And now we come to the great beard debate. Okay. Y'all, I just don't get, the things that Harry says, I mean, you could just, it's like, if he hadn't told us he was on drugs, we would have all come to the conclusion on our own. So he wanted to wear his beard for his wedding, okay? And he's also gonna be wearing a military uniform. Well, the, you know, never the twain shall meet. According to British tradition and American also, you can't have a beard in uniform. Now, I don't know if this is true for the Brits, but I think it is. Um, you can have a mustache, but you cannot have the full beard. So he wants the full beard. And for very personal and specific reasons, he says, I know it was illogical, but I needed the beard because it helped me cope with my anxiety. I'd grown the beard during my voyage to the South Pole and I kept it up returning home and it helped me along with therapy and meditation and a few other things, drugs, to quell my nerves. I can't explain it, but I did find some articles describing the phenomenon. Maybe it was Freudian, you know, Beard as a security blanket, and maybe it was Jungian, beard as a mask. But whatever it was, it made me calmer. And I wanted to feel as calm as possible on the day of my wedding, so I wasn't about to shave the beard. I don't feel like he knows who Jung or Freud are, but I'm just going to keep that to myself. Anyway, he says that the other thing was, Megan had never seen it without the beard, so he didn't want to her to walk down the aisle to a perfect stranger. And also, she loved to grab onto it and pull him in for a kiss. And so it was just like, you know, you couldn't get rid of that. How was she gonna kiss him if she couldn't jerk his facial hair towards her? Um, 
he says he went and explained it to Granny, and she understood perfectly. She said that her own husband liked to rock a bit of a scruff now and then, and she said, you can have the beard, it's not that big of a deal. But when he went and told William about it, William bristled. And he was outraged that Harry would even consider it, and moreover, that he would have asked Granny about it. He says that William said, uh, it can't be done. I mean, that military rules and so forth. You can't have the beard. Stop trying to push the rules. This is the rule. This is the road. Walk ye in it. Okay? There's rules for a reason, Harold. Um, and Harry's like, William, what are you talking about, though? Because I can Google search and I, and I have images to prove that there's a lot of different monarchs who wore a suit and had a beard. Um, and he shares many examples. William would have none of it. And when he found out that Harry had gone and spoken to Granny about it and gotten the green light, that made him angrier all the more. You want to ask her? Well, yeah. Well, what did Granny say? Well, she said, keep the beard. You put her in the uncomfortable position, Harold. She had no choice but to say yes. No choice? Oh. Well, she's the queen. If she didn't want me to have a beard, I think she can speak for herself. But Willie always thought Granny had a soft spot for me, that she indulged me while holding him to an impossibly high standard. And because, you know, he was the heir and I was the spare and it irked him a good bit. So the argument, according to Harry, goes on and on and on. It goes on in person. It goes on over the phone. It goes on over text. William can't get over it. He says at one point, William actually ordered him to shave the beard. I'm the heir. Speaking to the spare, you better get rid of that beard. Are you serious? I'm telling you, shave it off. For the love of God, Willie, what does it matter to you so much about the beard? Get off my back. Because I wasn't allowed to keep my beard. Now, this is the conversation according to Harry. Okay. And all oh, there it was. After he'd come back from an assignment with special forces, Willie was sporting a full beard, and somebody told him to be a good boy, run along, shave it off. He hated the idea of me enjoying a perk that he'd been denied. And also, says Harry, I suspected that it brought back I suspected that it brought back bad memories of being told he couldn't marry in the uniform of his choice. And then he confirmed my suspicion. He said it outright. In one of our beard debates, he complained bitterly about my being allowed to marry in my household cavalry frock coat, which he'd wanted to wear at his wedding. Remember that whole story? Remember how he says that, you know, William had woken from a drunken stupor the day of his wedding, and he had found himself in this stupor because he had been so outraged humiliated, horrified, distraught that he couldn't wear the military uniform of his choosing. Okay, so uh, some more on that. We're getting more of that flavor here. And what's crazy is that at the time that we were taught, what we were reading about William's wedding, Harry had said, I did think it was outrageous he couldn't wear what he wanted. I mean, that's not fair at all. And I could see why he was upset. And this was ridiculous. But now he's saying to William, you're being ridiculous. You're being crazy. It's not a big deal if I get to wear what I want to wear and you didn't get to wear what you wanted to wear. Get over it. And would Harry have been able to get over it if William had been given a right that he was now being denied? Now, first of all, I don't think William was upset about it, but say like he was. You can't see. You, you in, in the wildest realms of your imagination, you can't understand how it is that Harry would be in, or that William would be annoyed that you get to do something and he's constantly being told, no, 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 William, this is the standard. You, you have to walk the standard. Your brother, that wild, crazy thing, who cares what he's up to? Let him do whatever he wants. You can't imagine that that would get to be a little bit wearing. Okay. Anyway, you know, Harry has that newfound backbone that he got from therapy and he tells Willie that his bearded brother is going to get married soon. 
and you can either get on board or not. But this is what's happening. You either you you either stand behind me, or you might as well just get out of the way. So now it's time for him to have his bachelor party. He says it was a great event. They had a good time, but he wasn't a hundred percent at his ease because Willie told him, "Look." You get too drunk, you pass out, I'm shaving that beard, okay? I'm after that beard tonight. So, mind your P's and Q's, because this mess on your face, we're getting rid of that. He says that despite having to sort of keep an eye on Willie the whole time, he did have a good time. He said that the stag party was at a friend's house, and it was basically a great big boys party. There was his brother, and then he had 15 friends there. Um, there was these, you know, the, the indoor tennis court at this guy's house had been kitted out with various fun toys. There was giant boxing gloves. There was bows and arrows. There was a mechanical bull. They, they painted their faces and roughhoused like idiots. It was all just great fun, right up his alley, really. He says after an hour or two, he was exhausted. He was hungry. They ate lunch. He said they had a big picnic in a large airy barn and then they trooped off to a makeshift shooting range. He says they were all drunk as skunks, but you know, it's a, and it's a wonder that nobody shot each other. They all had weapons, but somehow nobody got hurt. And then he had the brilliant idea. He says, when everyone was bored of firing rifles, they dressed me up as a giant yellow feathered chicken and they sent me down range to shoot fireworks at me. <laughs> Wild. Oh, I mean, okay, fine. I admitted it was actually my idea, but, I mean, whatever. I offered to do it. Whoever comes closest wins. And he says it made him think about all those times when he and Willie and Hugh and Emily's boys had spent all those afternoons trying to chilly, kill each other. Remember that boy who fell down the well and they threw a bunch of fireworks down at him? Good times. Um, and he just wondered, you know, what had happened to the closeness of those days back when he and Willie had been such good friends? What you talking about, Harry? Because back when you were telling us that story, you were telling about how you'd had to defend William because, you know, he was just a weakling and he couldn't defend himself and he resented you even then. What are you talking about, Harry? You think I don't remember? I remember. Do you not remember? He was your enemy even then. So why are you acting now? I mean, according to you, he was your enemy then. So why are you acting now like, oh, it's just wild. It's just wild how our relationship has taken this sudden turn. Um, okay, so after they get done pretending to kill each other and drinking themselves silly, oh, we come to the great Tiara story. I don't get this. And this is what I'm saying. Remember at the beginning of the episode, remember at the beginning of the episode, I said, he's going to go on to tell us tons of stories about how people did him an injustice and, and people had ill intentions for him. And, and there was just all kinds of uh, undercurrent of, of, of angst and, and, and anger and disdain and dislike and people just trying to, 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 to stop him from getting ahead. Remember I said that? Okay. But then he doesn't give us any foundation. Classic story. Uh, and the tiara is a classic story of everyone was against me. Oh, really? Tell me how? Why? What did they do? What did they say? How did they show that they were against you? I don't know, but they were. I could sense it to my understanding. They were double-crossing me and my girlfriend. So, in this wild tale, he says that Megan had had to, you know, go to the mattresses about whether she got to wear a veil or not. Okay, so there had been some question. Can a divorcee even wear a veil? Finally, they decided she could. Um... But then there was a question of the tiara and his aunt had said to Megan, would you like to wear Princess Diana's tiara? Oh, how kind, you know? Oh, yes, of course, yes. I, of course I want to wear Princess Diana's tiara. I've only been faking to be her, you know, for about three years now. So, according to Harry, they had spent hours with her dress designer trying to get the veil perfect so that it would match the tiara and there was a scalloped edge on the tiara and they were trying to match that in the veil right so a lot of work had already been done with the dress and with this specific tiara but lo and behold who should they get a call from but granny granny says 
come on over. I want to show you my tiaras. And if you want one of them, you are welcome to choose one of them. Uh, yeah, you, you know, bustle right over. Make sure you don't miss that appointment. He says, it was an extraordinary moment, morning. We've all heard this, you guys. And this is much like the, when he gets pushed in the dog bowl story. Um, they get to go to Granny's private dressing room. It's right next to her room. Harry had never even been to this part of the palace. While they were in there, uh, there was an expert jeweler there. He was an eminent historian. He knew the lineage of every stone in, the, in those tiaras. So, I mean, it was not just try on some tiaras, but it was a real experience, right? Beautiful choices. One had emeralds. One had aquamarines. They were all dazzling. They were stunning. To be able to have your choice of any of these was beyond any woman's wildest imagination. Of course, Megan was in her element. Granny was just being really lovely, you know, so complimentary to Megan. These look lovely on you. You wear a tiara so well. It's just a really, really beautiful, generous, warm moment, right? Tender moment. And Granny says before they leave, she says, look, make sure that you practice putting it on because it can be really difficult. It's a lot more cumbersome than you'd think it would be. And also, you know, the tiara is going to have to be sewn into your veil and it can just be really, it's just way more than you think it would be. So make sure you try it on. Don't let your wedding day be the first day you put this on. Okay. Okay. Everyone in the room heard. Harry heard. Megan heard. Granny said it. Then Angela, Granny's dresser and confidant, who was also in attendance, heard this entire conversation. So they were all on the same page. Um, Megan also talked to Catherine and Catherine said, yes, absolutely. Do not let your wedding day be the first day that this tiara and you, you know, come together because it is, it's, it's, it's not what you think it would be. It's just, it's hard to wear and it's hard to figure out how to, exactly how to have it on with your veil and all this. Make sure that you've, you and your dressmakers have had time with it, right? Okay, so this had been well established that this needed to happen. But for some reason, Angela would not respond to their messages when they needed to try on the tiara. And when they, the, the hairdresser had come to town, he'd flown in from France to do the hair and do the tiara and get the veil all figured out. And when they called Angela to arrange for it, Angela was nowhere to be found. Wouldn't answer any messages, wouldn't answer any phone calls. She just kind of disappeared. They kept trying, there was no response. When they finally reached her, she said that the tiara would require an orderly and a police escort to leave the palace, which shocked Harry because she's like, what are you talking about? Like. <laughs> That seems a little bit much. Well, it is a irreplaceable tiara, so I don't know if it's a bit much, but anyway, Harry's like, all right, well then let's find some people who can do that. We got an orderly, we got a police officer, let's get it, let's get the show on the road. And Angela's like, it can't be done. Uh, well, why can't it then? All right, we've got people here. And she says her schedule was just too busy. Harry says she was being uh, obstructive, obviously, but he couldn't figure out what the reason was. You know, we, they had been given the right to the tiara, so now why was Angela withholding it? And they couldn't hazard a guess. And he thought about talking to Granny, but then he figured it was just gonna spark a whole confrontation and Angela was not a person to be crossed. He says that she, to his mind, Angela was just a troublemaker and he really didn't need her as an enemy, so he just didn't say anything. Way to go, Harry. Way to get the, the way to get stuff done. If everybody in that whole room had heard that the tiara was for you and Megan for your wedding day, it would not have been, you know, beyond the pale for you have then gone to Granny and said, Hey Granny, remember how you said that we could use that tiara? We're having a really hard time getting a hold of it um, in a timely fashion because the hairdresser is here. Is there anything that you can do? Angela says she doesn't have any time. Is there anybody else that you would be comfortable with sending that crown? Or, or sending that tiara along with, you know, is there anything we need to do? Do we need to come to the palace? Maybe we could bring the hairdresser to the palace. I just want to make sure this gets done because I know Megan's really concerned about it. Right? Like, you get the ball rolling. Like, if somebody's causing problems, but you know it's within your rights to have this thing, you don't just sit there and fume and be like, oh, stupid Angela, what a troublemaker she always was. No, you, you figure out a way to get it done. 
And I, you know, so instead they're just sitting around, you know, holding each other, weeping on each other's necks. Why can't we get the tiara? Why can't we get the tiara? We'll go get the tiara. Okay, so she, but according to Harry, she held all the cards. She still had the tiara. So, you know, what was he going to do? I don't know. Go get it from her. What are you talking about? Okay. Um, and again, what evidence did he have that Angela was a troublemaker? Other than the fact that he says she was. But I, it just, like, this story is just, it does not make sense. It's just bonkers. If everybody heard the same thing you heard, there's like five witnesses to the statement that Granny said you could have the tiara. Then go get it. Why are you sitting around being a victim to Angela's bad attitude? I don't know what, I don't know Angela's story. Maybe she is a, you know, a troublemaker, you know, one of these courtiers that's always causing problems. Maybe she is. But if that is true, and you still had all these other people who can attest to the fact that you get the tiara, go get it. God, Harry, you're such a weakling. Okay, can you imagine being married to this man? Poor Megan. Maybe that, maybe, maybe being married to him is, you know, her just desserts. Anyway, um, then he goes off on this long jag about the fact that he was a little bit worried that the wedding itself is just going to be an absolutely dangerous experience for both he and Megan. Because how did he know that there wasn't going to be some deranged idiot who just showed up at the scene to mow everybody down? Because that happens in England all the time. Okay, so he says that he really wishes that there had been... There'd been a story in the press that special forces had come and abducted Megan from the house and had like done this whole training scenario so that she would know what to do. In the, according to Harry, very likely event, she get kidnapped by, an, you know, some madman. He says that he couldn't be more disappointed by the fact that that wasn't a true statement. That he wishes that that had been a true story. He would have done anything to have gotten special forces to help. He says that... Um, he felt so, he felt really panicky because he says that the palace had flo had floated the idea that they might not even give her any security. Hold up. I know that was his big complaint at the Oprah thing because they had left England. As long as she was in England, she was getting security, okay? So just please. But even at this early date, he claims that they're going to try to take her security. On the contrary. The pals had floated the idea of not giving her any security at all because I was now sixth in line to the throne. And how I wish the reports about special forces were even partly true. How I longed to phone my mates in special forces and have them come and train Meg and retrain me. Or better yet, pitch in and protect us. Come on, you guys, pitch in for free, right? Can you not do that? For, the, for that matter, I wish I could send special forces to go and grab that tiara. Because Angela still hadn't delivered it. He said, again, Megan's hairdresser had come from France for the rehearsal. And the tiara still wasn't there. So he'd had to go back. And they'd found Angela again. And again, nothing. Angela's just totally ghosting them. Finally, Angela appeared out of thin air in, at Kensington Palace. And he said he met her in the audience room. And she put before him a release, which she signed. And then she handed him the tiara. So it wasn't this big thing after all with the police escort and, you know, an orderly and all this. She could just hand it over after he signed a piece of paper. Harry says he thanked her, but he added that it would have made everybody's lives so much easier to have had it done sooner. Her eyes were fire. She started to have a go at me. And I said, Angela, you really want to do this now? Really? Now? She fixed me with a look that made me shiver. I could read in her face a clear warning. This isn't over. What fantasy world does he live in? What wild fantasy world? What, what, what realms of idiocy does he reign? Because this doesn't make any sense. This story doesn't make any sense. What, what benefit would Angela have in withholding from the prince what the queen had said was his right? I mean, Angela doesn't have this, this wild sway that she's just like, well, the queen said this, but I'm going to do this. Like, some we are missing part of the story here and he's throwing angela under the bus and you know quite frankly if, if all this is true angela doesn't look that great in the story but i don't believe that's the story i don't believe that that's really what happened we'll find out okay when we read revenge 
when we get to this gem, we're going to find out a whole bunch of stuff that we just aren't getting from this book because this is just bits and pieces, right? It's like trying to put a puzzle together. I got two pieces of the puzzle. I got, I got, I got one corner piece and one middle piece. What, what, what's this picture here? I know it's a puzzle. I, I don't know. I don't know anything about this. That's how I feel reading this story. Something happened, not this. Anyway, now we go on to talk about how, oh, more about Megan's father. Megan's dad um, started to act real sketchy before the wedding. And Jason, the guy, the palace comms guy, had phoned them and said, look, we, we've got a real problem. What? What's the problem? Said Meg. Apparently the mail on Sunday is was going to run a story saying that Meg's father had been working with the Paps for money and he'd staged some candid photos. And so Jason was really unhappy about this. And Megan's like, oh no, that can't be right. So she calls her dad and she says, daddy, we might be able to kill this story, but it, if it turns out that you're lying, we'll never be able to kill a false story about ourselves or our children again. So this is serious. You must tell us the truth, daddy. Did you work with the photographers? You've got to be honest about it, okay? I know it can be scary, but you've got to be a big boy. And he swears he never staged any photos. He didn't have anything to do with it. He doesn't know any paparazzi. He's never worked with anybody salacious before a day in his life. Okay, he's not lying. He really, he doesn't know anything. So they tell him, all right, well, if that's the case, you need to get out of there because they, there's, a, there's a huge story coming against you. You might not be aware of it, but the paparazzi are claiming that you set up some photos with them and it's just going to be a mess. So you need to leave Mexico. Please come to England. We will take care of you. We will give you a place to live. Just you, you're coming soon anyway for the wedding. Just come early. Avoid this whole thing. But that's when he starts getting shady on the phone and he's like, actually, no, I can't leave. I got some stuff I got to do. And apparently, I mean, Thomas Markle never had anything to do. So they're like, wait a second, this doesn't make any sense. Harry, wait a second, he's lying. So the story breaks the next morning and it's way worse than they thought. They said that there was a video of Meg's father meeting the paparazzi at an internet cafe. There was a series of farcical staged photos that included him reading a book about Britain as if he was studying to go to the wedding. And the photos were reportedly worth 100,000 pounds. I guess that's where he got that number. Remember how he said that photos of them were going for 100,000 pounds? So I guess there was this one scenario in which there had been some photos linked to them that were worth this much. And Harry says it seemed to prove beyond all doubt that Meg's father was had indeed been lying and that he'd taken part in this bakery and that he'd probably done it to make some money. And he must have done it because they had some kind of leverage on him or, or something like that. Like, why else would he work with the paparazzi? They didn't know. Headlines ran everywhere that Meghan Markle's father was a con artist and that he'd staged these candid photos for money. Okay. I remember those dumb pictures. It's kind of a, like, definitely a sleazy move to make money with the paparazzi. Um, it's just like, how hard up must you be? But it wasn't like he'd given a tell-all story about Meg or like had, had shared photos that had been private and intimate of like family gatherings and stuff that she had never given any permission for the paparazzi to have. It was just a bunch of stupid pictures of him looking at a, a you know, a tourist guide of, of Britain, like, like he's getting ready to go to his daughter's wedding. Like they were just dumb, poorly taken photos that weren't exciting in the least. So I don't really understand the drama of it, you know, like. I guess since Harry and Meghan feel like the paparazzi are their, you know, true enemies in life. It's like the paparazzi and then the devil. I, I just feel like they're just kind of making a lot about this. And I don't necessarily think it's all that big of a deal. Like, on, on, on the spectrum of things that are a big deal, I probably wouldn't be, like, I'd be like, Daddy, that was lame but only because you look stupid. Like, what is that picture? <laughs> like, I wouldn't be like, how could you do this to me? I'd just be like, I thought better of you, daddy, but okay. Um, so anyway, it's just treacherous and it's completely ruined the days leading up to the wedding. Because Maggie can't think about anything else. She's consumed with what her dad's doing. This huge story about him working with the paparazzi. 
Um, she says that after the story broke, then her dad comes crawling back and he says that he sent them a text that said, I'm so ashamed. Probably embarrassed. Um, he says that they had phoned him and texted him and they'd phoned him again. But after that initial admission of guilt, they couldn't get a hold of him. They told him, we're not angry. Just pick up the phone. Like we just want, let's like have a clean slate. Supposedly, that's what they said. I can't imagine that they weren't angry because they're so consumed with the story that if they weren't angry, they would have been able to move on with wedding preparations. But no, they had heard along with the rest of the world that he'd apparently had a heart attack and he wasn't coming to the wedding. So this was, you know, brand new information to them. They had no idea that this is how it was going to go. And now we come to the famous story of Megan and Kate and the dresses. So apparently one day after all of this news had broke about the dad, Meg received a text from Kate. There was a problem with the dresses for the bridesmaids because apparently they needed to be altered. Now the dresses, the dresses were French couture. They were hand sewn and they were for measurements only. So it wasn't a super huge shock that they would need to be altered. But Megan, got the text yet chose not to reply straight away because there's just so much going on with her dad. What? Like what's, what, what's precluding you from, from getting in contact with people? The wedding is in four days, right? So you might want to shore up everything with all the people who are going to be in the wedding um, and not worry so much about your crazy dad, right? Because he is nuts, but he's over there across the, the ocean doing his nut thing. So you need to make sure that the stuff that's going on for your wedding day has been solved. Anyway, Kate says, hey, these dresses, it's not gonna work. And Meg sees the text, but doesn't respond. Anyway, eventually the next day, she finally gets around to texting Kate again. So we're, we're just getting closer to the wedding and there's problems that need to be solved. And she texts Kate that the tailor is standing by at the palace, his name's AJ, All right? So she but Harry writes, this wasn't sufficient for Kate. That's what he says. This wasn't sufficient for Kate. They set up a time to speak that afternoon. Charlotte's dress is too big. It's too long. It's too baggy. She cried when she tried it on at home, Kate said. Right. And I told you, the tailor has been st standing by since 8 a.m. Here at Kensington Palace. Can you take Charlotte in to have it altered? as the other moms are doing? No, all the dresses have to be remade. Her own wedding dress designer agreed, Kate added. Meg asked if Kate was aware of what was going on right now with her father. Don't you have any idea what I'm dealing with right now? And you want me to worry about your little kid's dress? Get it together, okay? The tailor's at the palace, all right? So you can just march your little self over there and your little bratty daughter and get your dress fixed. Um, and you know, Harry wasn't even on this call yet. Apparently he knows everything that happened on it. He says that Kate admitted, I know what's going on, but the dresses and Megan, the wedding is in only four days. So we have to get this, we have to have this settled. Kate had other problems with the way that Meg was planning her wedding something about a party for the page boys. I mean, what was she banging on about? Why couldn't Catherine just let Megan alone? I mean, the page boys, half the kids in the wedding were from North America. They hadn't even arrived yet. What was she talking about? The conversation went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And it ends with Meg saying, I'm not sure what else to say or even what you want me to say. If the dress doesn't fit, then please take Charlotte to see AJ. He's been waiting all day. It's your own problem. All right. You got problems with the dress. Get it taken to be altered. My tailor's been waiting for you. So quit whining about it. Do something about it. Oh, it's like this ridiculous conversation. Tempers are running really high. And I don't understand why she's using her dad as an excuse not to finish up plans with the wedding. And I know being a bride can be super stressful. Everybody wants your take on things and everybody, because you are supposed to be like the queen of the day. I hated that part. I'm like, y'all just make some decisions on your own. I don't care. I'm just showing up to get married. Right? So I understand like it can be a little bit draining. Everybody needs something from you, every little thing. And you know, it's like, 
I was not all that concerned about the nitty gritty details, but it seems to me like Megan would be the sort that would have to have her stamp of approval on everything. So Kate probably wanted to be sure, look, this thing needs to be done. Are you okay with me going ahead and getting this done? You know what I'm saying? Anyway. Um, of course, after that conversation's done, what should Harry walk in on? A short time later, I arrived home and I found Meg on the floor, sobbing. How many times does she just throw herself on the floor crying? I mean, is she crying all day long on the floor? So that he's just wandering in and out of doors and just tripping over her body? Like, is that just like where she hangs out on the floor crying? You know what I'm saying? It's like, or does she like wait by the window, see him coming up the walk and throw herself on the floor? How many times could you find somebody in this position? And why is she always on the floor crying? Couldn't you sit in a chair and cry, sit on the bed and cry, sit on the couch and cry? Why are you on the floor? Okay, so the next day, Kate comes and she brings flowers and a card and she says that she's sorry. Harry wants to let you know that Lindsay was in the kitchen, Lindsay, who's Meg's best friend, and she witnessed the whole thing. I don't know why he's telling us that. I got, there are witnesses, I guess, to the fact that Kate in, maybe admitted to being the one in the wrong. I don't think Kate was admitting she was the one in the wrong. I think she's just like, look, we need to move on. We're two grownups here. So if it means that I have to say, I'm sorry, I'll do that. You know, let's just, we're going to be sisters-in-law. Let's, I don't want it to start out like this. Also, Harry did tell Meg, <clears throat> I, I don't think that Kate means anything by this. I think you don't, don't get too worked, worked up about it. All right, this is our last story. It's the eve of the wedding. He's staying at Cotworth Park Hotel and he had several friends with him um, and several commented that he just seemed like he was distracted and he's like, well, yeah, there's been a lot going on. Well, you know, what with the tiara, what with Kate being a psycho, you know, what with my, with, with Meg's dad not showing up, you know, working with the paps, having heart attacks. It's just really hard to keep my mind, you know, on the wedding. And... You know, of course, he says he didn't he didn't want to say too much, which could be the entire title of this section. I don't want to say too much because he's not saying anything yet. He's whining and banging on for page after page. Um, he said that he was worried about Meg's dad. He was worried about Kate in the dress. He was constantly worried that somebody in the crowd is going to do something crazy. And then the other thing he couldn't get his heart and mind around was the fact that Willie wasn't there. It was a real sore subject. He said that Willie had been scheduled to join them for that evening. It had been on the plan. But like Meg's father, he'd canceled last minute. Bunch of losers up in this place. He said that right before they had attended tea with Granny, he just couldn't do it. I, I can't do it, Harold. I got Kate. I got the kids. I'm sorry. Tonight's not going to be a good night for me to come by. And I reminded him that this was our tradition. That they had dinner before his wedding. And Harry says, you know, my plan was to go out and visit and, and mingle with people just like we did on yours and, and thank everyone for coming. Well, he holds fast. I can't do it. Harry pushes. Why are you being like this, Willie? Why? I was with you the whole night before you married Kate. Why are you doing this? He keeps asking over and over. He thinks maybe it's because he made Charlie his best man instead of Willie. And probably William's just over there nursing a grudge about that. And I wonder why he hit, why he did make Charlie his best man. Because remember how hurt and wounded he'd been when William hadn't made him the official best man? So did he do it out of spite? I mean, I don't understand. Like, he hated it so much. Why didn't he then say, okay, well, William didn't make me his best man. And I didn't like the way that felt. So I'm going to make William my best man this time. Because that's how I wanted it to be. But no, and so now he thinks maybe William's just being mad about that. It's interesting to me, like, all the hateful, spiteful things that he accuses William of doing are things that I could have seen Harry doing. But anyway, isn't that what these people do? It's always project, project, project. He says maybe William is still mad about how he gets to wear his beard. Yeah, I'm sure William's really up at night crying about that. Maybe he's feeling guilty about the business between Kate and Meg. But whatever it was, he was giving no indication of what the problem was. He just kept saying no. And then he said to him, Harold, what, why does it even matter? Why do you care? Well, why are you even saying hello to the crowds, Harold? You know, you're scared of them. You say you, you're afraid that they're going to jump out and do something to you. You don't have to go out if you don't want to. Because the press office told me to. 
And we did it your way. Yeah, but you don't need to listen to them. Do, do your own thing. Well, since bloody when do I not have to listen to them? Well, that's rich. So the, the thing is, he just felt sick about it. I mean, he'd always believed, despite their problems, that they had this undying bond that was really strong. And he thought the brotherhood would always trump the bridesmaid's dress or a beard, but I suppose not. And then he says that just after leaving Granny's around 6 p.m., Willie texted that he had changed his mind. He would come. Maybe Granny had intervened. Harry didn't know. But whatever. He thanked him heartily and happily, and he was excited to share the moment with his brother. He says that they went out, and they spoke to the crowds, and they walked up and down, and they thanked them for coming, and people wished them well. And then he says that they drove off, and he asked William to come and have dinner with him. Maybe stay the night, since he'd, after all, stayed the night with William. He'd come for dinner, he said, but he couldn't stay the night. Well, come on, please, Willie. Sorry, Harold, I can't. I got kids. And that's where we're going to end for today. Oh, goodness. Okay, so like I've been saying this entire time, have you ever in all of your life heard so much vitriol without any substantiating evidence? I haven't. I just don't understand how you can make all these wild claims and all these stories without any kind of evidence. They're not persuasive stories. I think that that's really why I'm offended. I'm not persuaded. If you want me to side with you, if you want me to see that you have just been hurt and harmed, maligned and mistreated, you're gonna have to give me some evidence as to the intentions of these people. You can't just say, well, I think that this is how it was. What's their motivation? Tell me. This is not going to help me side with you. You can't just tell me that Angela was acting like ugly, but you don't know why she was. You don't know what her purpose was. You don't know what she's trying to hold over you. None of that. And I agree. And that if that if, if, if everything that story was 100% true, Angela does seem like she's being very difficult. And I don't know why, why she would do that. But see, that's the thing. People don't just do crazy things. They have a reason for why they do them. And especially when you had that many people witnessing the promise of that specific tiara. But then the other thing too is, if Megan had spent so many hours getting her dress ready to match Diana's tiara, why didn't she wear Diana's tiara? That had been the original plan anyway. The dress had been designed for that tiara. So if you couldn't get a hold of the other one, why wouldn't you just be like, you know what? Scrap that idea. Let's go with our original idea. It matches the dress anyway. It just seems like we're not getting the full story. But like I said, I believe that Tom Bauer will come through for us when we finally get to revenge because that is what we're going to do. So I think by now we all realize revenge is next. Um, I have to read revenge after that. After this book spare, I got to get some facts. I am dying to hear the story from a reasonable, balanced, well-researched perspective because this trash and drivel is driving me crazy. I, I said this over and over and over and over when I first started reading the book. This is not a well-written book. And I had a lot of reasons for saying that. And I got a few people in the comments saying, you don't know what you're talking about. Everyone who has read and reviewed this book says that, well, we might not like Harry. The book itself is well-written. It's not a well-written book. It's not. You can not give me scraps, bits, pieces of scenarios and then i'm supposed to come to i'm, I'm supposed to follow your con your final conclusion you have to lead me there you cannot make a wild claim and say and that's and it means this hey there is a whole wealth of information right here in the middle you didn't share so i can't I'm, I'm not traveling to that conclusion with you you didn't bring me there so you failed you failed the objective of this book you wanted me to side with you on all of your petty grievances. And if you could prove it, you have a whole bunch of people who would have been willing to side with you for your petty grievances. Tons of people believed that stupid Oprah interview. Tons of people thought that Meghan and Harry had been treated unkindly and improperly. There was even racist overtones to the way they'd been treated in the family. So many people we're on that little bandwagon, believing them, trusting them, sorry for them. If he could have proven that he was right in all these scenarios, but he can't, he can't tell the stories the way they happened. Because they didn't, because he's lied. He's lied, Megan's lied. They say all of these things, 
took place. But then of course he's got to have these huge gaps of logic in all of the stories because if he says what really happened, he's going to lose what few audience members he still has. Well, I mean, he lost us a long time ago, but I just can't believe that if you finally have the chance to tell your story about the man that you've become, this would be your offering. This is what you have. This is what we're supposed to listen to. It's just wild to me. This is the best he can do. All right, this video is the longest one I've filmed yet, so I'm gonna let you go. Next time, we're gonna read about the wedding and all the stuff that happens and how eventually they decide that they have to run away. Well, I don't know if we're gonna get all the way to them running away, but next time we get to talk about the wedding. All right, um, I think that's it. I'll see you guys later this week. Bye.